Well, welcome everybody. Um, that is not me. I hope everybody recognizes it's Jack Nicholson. Um, but I did think it was a good slide to start the presentation with. Uh, this is something that gardeners are going to uh, see uh, probably a lot more information coming uh, out. Uh, it's something that's happening very, very quickly. And as we go through the presentation, you will see what I mean by it. I think a lot of people, they might look and, and um, see the, 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 you know, it's about earthworms. Good Lord, why are we at all concerned about earthworms? And I'm going to show you why it's maybe as bad as the way Jack Nicholson is looking right now. Um, the next slide looks kind of silly as well, um, but it's that sort of point of, oh my Lord, you're telling me I need to be concerned about a worm of all things. Why would we be concerned about earthworms? Earthworms have been in our gardens for a very long time. Uh, we have been told um, over and over again that earthworms are good for gardeners. So why is this something different? And let's get right into it. Um, one of the other things I'll tell you uh, in advance, there's one video uh, on here that comes off the internet. Um, we found with another presentation that I did, when you're viewing it blown up on my screen, it might be grainy on your end uh, for the video uh, that I'm going to show you. It's more about what they're saying. So if it's a little grainy, but then I send the link to Sarah and she will make the recorded version of this available to you later. And she'll also provide you uh, the link uh, to the video so you can see it uh, more clearly. So uh, these are things we're learning as we uh, move forward uh, with Zoom presentations. <laughs> I think we learn something every time. So Asian jumping worms. Um, first, I want to go through a little bit of review about earthworms altogether. Like I said, many people are going to say, uh, what's the big deal being upset about earthworms? They've been here forever. Well, interestingly, they haven't. Uh, North American uh, earthworms disappeared about 10,000 years ago uh, when the glaciers wiped them out. There were some that survived down in the, the southern regions of our country, uh, but overall we lost most of what would have then been our indigenous earthworm population. So the earthworms that we see most commonly today actually came over with European settlers uh, in around, right around the 1600s. And of course, we've learned so much about so many of the invasive, what we call consider invasive uh, plants, uh, insects, um, um, uh, any of the, the fauna as well. Usually they get inadvertently transported in some way. Uh, so the European earthworms came over in ships. They probably were in root balls of plants that were being brought from Europe and, and the ballast of the ships. Once they arrived here, you, as you can imagine, the soils here were at the most ideal that they would possibly be before we started then uh, tilling the soils. And it was just, uh, it, it was just like a smorgasbord for the earthworms. And so they, they made it here, they started populating, and they moved throughout the country uh, relatively fast. Uh, because we had uh, some of the richest topsoils at that point that we probably would have ever seen. Um, here is the video I want to show you. I'm going to, no, I have to turn on the volume, sorry. And then let me just pause it for a minute. What I want to tell you is I want you a, ba a little bit of background on earthworms to begin with because that background is going to help you understand why these species of earthworms are an issue. So we're going to go through about six minutes of this. I'll shut it off before it's done. Um, I discovered I couldn't um, actually uh, cut the video. Uh, I'll turn it off and then we'll continue on. So here we go. Through human activity, many species are transported to new areas where they grow, reproduce, and thrive. And there are thousands of non-native species in the United States. A more limited subset of those is invasive species. And those are non-native species 
that cause or have the potential to cause economic harm or harm to human health. These invasive species can cause billions of dollars of damage to ecosystems that provide us with resources, such as timber. One group of non-native species in North America that we are all familiar with is earthworms, creatures capable of doing great harm and great good. A group of creatures that, by chewing up carbon in the soil, could even impact the course of climate change. Today, if we look at the earthworms that are in this soil, virtually all of them will be non-native species. Pretty much 100% of the earthworms that are in your garden, that are in your lawn, that you find on the sidewalks after a rain are non-native species. Oh, here we go. This is one of our non-natives. This is Lumbricus rubellus. Some earthworms came as early as the 1600s with the first European settlers and ship ballast and potted plants. So there are a whole variety of mechanisms by which they came over. Most of them were probably not on purpose. Today, we know that earthworms are good for gardens, but are they good for forests? So for the same reasons that earthworms are really good for your garden, they can actually do a lot of damage to forests such as the one we're standing in here. The plants in North American forests are already adapted to the tough soil. When earthworms come in, the soil composition changes, and this changes what plants will flourish. Native plants may not do as well with the new soil. If nutrients here were suddenly much more available, say if we fertilized a bunch of this forest, we would get a very, very different group of plant species. And in that group of plant species would be a lot of non-native plants that are able to get at those nutrients. To find out if earthworms can be classified as harmful invasive species, Dennis Wiggins and Melissa McCormick's research team, in collaboration with Purdue University, compares the abundance of earthworms to forest damage. The team tests for abundance by adding electric current to the ground, causing the earthworms to move to the surface. So we have conducting rods into the soil and we apply that current and it creates an electric field that stimulates the worms to get out of the way so they come to the surface. Another sign of earthworm abundance is at the surface of the soil. Earthworm waste or casts, reveal that all of the soil at this site has been digested by earthworms. So here we're in a young forest. And if you pull back the leaf litter that's just fallen this year, what you see is bare soil. You can see all of these little holes here are earthworm burrows. And if you look closely at the surface of the soil, what you'll see is it's made up almost entirely of this here, which is earthworm casts. So this is all soil, but it's all soil that has passed through an earthworm gut once, if not several times. The team has found that earthworms are very abundant in young forests. So two months ago, this surface was covered by leaves, just like this. And two months later, you can see nothing is here. Everything is gone and the worms were super hungry. They eat all of them. By digesting so much of the soil and leaves, earthworms repackage many of the nutrients into different forms that make them less accessible for plants. In gobbling up all of the soil, they also are gobbling up many of the microorganisms that are in the soil. And it could be that some of the species in the forest that require fungi in association with their roots, which is most of the plants, that they could not do as well. And what we found is that uh, the red oak, for example, was a species that its growth was less in situations where there were a lot of earthworms. To make sure that earthworms are the cause of the decrease of accessible nutrients, the team studies plots in a mature forest where there are no earthworms. You might remember as we were in the young forest, the leaves were added two months ago and now they've all gone. But here, those leaves have been added at the same time 
uh, as the young forest, but you can see they are still here, nothing changed. And the main reason for this is there's no hungry worms eating those leaves. In the earthworm free soil, the team finds plenty of fungi that provide nutrients that help native plants and trees to grow. So in terms of both the diversity of fungi that we find in the soil and in terms of the absolute abundance of fungi that we find in the soil, this soil here is much, much higher than the young forest soil. The lack of nutrients in a young forest could be interpreted as evidence for earthworms to be classified as invasive, but there are signs that earthworms may be an asset to us for one very important global issue, climate change. Okay, that's where I'm stopping us. They go on to talk uh, about carbon um, uh, sequestering uh, carbon, and, and there's a lot of research still being done about that. Uh, whether the fact that they're chewing up all of this organic matter and releasing carbon dioxide into the air short term is adding uh, to the issue, or if the fact that they're converting a lot of this into something else long term uh, means they're actually helping. But uh, that's for further research. Um, so anyway, one, one that's just a little background then on earthworms and the well, context that they're talking about there would be more of the European type earthworms. I think one of the takeaways for me when I was watching the video is I've always have known and appreciated the fact that our soils contain a wide diversity of living things, uh, our, the fungi, uh, that's uh, the mycorrhizae, things of that nature, microorganisms. But I think in my mind's eye, I always thought about all of these things sort of coexisting together. Uh, the fact that too many earthworms, they're, when they're consuming the soil, they're also consuming many of these microorganisms. And I hadn't really thought about that. Of course, all of the pictures, you know, that we make these lovely pictures that are going on. I have no idea what just happened on there on the screen. <laughs> um, but anyway, uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm sitting here not touching a thing, so that's really weird. Uh, but anyway, you know, now, now I'm starting to think about the fact, and you'll see this when we talk about the Asian uh, jumping worms, that they're also consuming many of the other microorganisms that these plants need. So what is it then that makes the Asian jumping worm different than these European worms? And again, um, many of you as gardeners say, okay, you're showing us their effect in the forest, in the woodland, in native uh, and natural areas, why would, you know, why should I be concerned I'm a, a gardener? Well, we should all be concerned because as gardeners, if we have issues in our gardens uh, and that's where they start, uh, and if that's where we're, uh, our conditions are so good that we're creating large populations, then we're gonna contribute to moving them into the natural areas. So whether you're a gardener or not, we should all be concerned about how this affects uh, the natural areas. So what are they then? What makes them different? And you're gonna hear them, apparently you have to control volume separately. Uh, and I ran through this before as well. Um, anyways, there they are. Uh, you'll hear across the, the country them called by different things, Asian jumping worms. A lot of times they just simplify it, call them jumping worms or called crazy worms, Alabama, uh, Alabama jumpers and snake worms. Well, looking at that uh, little piece of video there, you can see why they move very differently um, than the earthworms you're probably familiar with. Uh, this particular group um, does, um, I think, let's see, uh, involve uh, 51 species, but the two that we're seeing right now most commonly uh, in, in the Midwest um, are the, um, uh, the Amanthus agristus and the Amanthus tokiensis. Uh, at least those are the ones, uh, I came from the Madison area, Madison, Wisconsin, where they've been dealing with us for a few years now, and those are the two predominant species there. Like I said, they're non-native, but also notice they're coming from Asia. They're not coming from Europe, 
uh, like the other earthworms we're already familiar with. As we said, uh, uh, they probably came the same way, infested plant materials. We're shipping uh, so much stuff around the world. Uh, they've been on the East Coast, and I happen to notice Carol Hahn is on today. Good to see you, Carol. Uh, Carol's from Virginia, so you probably have had them out there for some time now. Uh, two out of every three worms in my front yard are jumping worms. Jump, jumping worms. So they've been yeah. real enormous problem in the Northeast they're where they're, they're just devastating um, uh, the forest floor. The first population in Wisconsin was identified in 2013. I was still living there in 2013. I was working at Allen Centennial Gardens. I moved here two years later. The first time I saw them, I did not see them in my home garden, but the first time I saw them at Allen Centennial was three years later. They were all, they'd been first identified three years later, I'm already finding them in Allen Centennial. They were in the woodland garden. I think how they got there was um, I had revamped that area and brought in a whole bunch of compost. And I'm sure they came in with that compost and that's why that was the first that I saw them there. Uh, today, um, not that, that many years afterward, I know they're in every area of that garden, including a very large rock garden. It's an uh, alpine rock garden, which surprised them there because the, alp the rock garden has no real soil in it. So they thought that they wouldn't move into there because there's no compost for them to eat. And yet they're still finding them in that environment. And again, I showed you the image here before. The reason they are called jumping worms is they don't actually jump, uh, but they writhe around, uh, ride around like a snake. Um, and when you uncover a group of them and they get exposed to the air and the light, I, it, it kind of freaks you out. Uh, it's, it's, it's just kind of freaky the way that they do that. So that's what, what they are. Wow. Um, so again, the other thing that's interesting is they're not even in the same family as the European earthworm. So that might tell us something about the fact that, that they do behave uh, so differently than the ones we are fil uh, familiar with. Uh, so you'll see that they're actually in two different families. Um, and there it shows a um, sort of a comparison. Uh, one of the earthworms here, of course, that we are most familiar with um, is what we call the night crawler. Um, or when uh, upstate New York, where I'm from, we call them night walkers. Not sure why they actually crawl more. Uh, but you can see some comparison in them. We're going to talk a little bit more uh, down the line what those differences are. So to ID them, to know whether you have them, well, the first and easiest way um, is that when you uncover them, um, they are going to uh, do exactly what you saw in that bowl. Um, they're going to uh, move around significantly. One of your key uh, hints that you've got them, that's, that's what they are in the first place, is that you're disturbing the top layer of the soil. And you'll see a great num uh, 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 a large number of these in that very upper surface. That's not typical for earthworms. Uh, usually when you're finding earthworms in your gardens because you've dug down away. So these um, earthworms are very different in that they don't burrow deep. Um, they are very much surface. Uh, worm. So that's an indication right from the start. They will do that wiggling. Um, now here uh, you'll see some of the um, uh, comparisons and anatomy, the difference between uh, them and uh, both the night crawler and then the uh, red earthworm, uh, which is a fairly common one here. Uh, uh, some other major differences between these is that they are an annual worm, so they only the adult only lives one season, which is different than your uh, European earthworms that actually burrow down in deep and then they overwinter um, um, in that way. So, if you had a really high population of those and you had a really deep frost that year, that would help you control populations of your standard earthworm. However, when you have an, uh, an earthworm that's only gonna live one season and then 
that creates these cocoons that are going to overwinter, these cocoons are really, really tough. And they can go through extreme um, cold temperatures. So whereas the other population is very sensitive to that and, and cold winters like we have will control the populations, that's not true from the, for the Asian jumping worm. And another reason why those populations uh, can increase uh, so quickly. Uh, just some differences in how they look. Um, they do have this sort of firmer look to them. Uh, if you pick them up, uh, they're a little more almost millipede uh, in, the, in their um, uh, structure, whereas the other earthworms are a little more flaccid, uh, the skin more loose on them. Uh, we've already talked about the snake-like uh, nature. The other thing that you're going to see, and we're going to show this as well, is the ground, once you have a population of these, the upper surface of your uh, beds is, this, is going to look very different. And that's the uh, castings that they're leaving behind because the populations are so high, because they spend their time in the upper few inches of the soil, you are going to see a very large amount of castings. And I'll show you some of that as well. Another thing that's different is that if you pick them up and you're handling them, uh, they actually uh, will, the tail will break off. It's an escape uh, defense, which does not happen with other earthworms. So again, if you've got some in your hands, you don't know for sure, and you see that the, the tails uh, can break off that easily, uh, you, know, you know you have the Asian uh, group of them. Uh, this is a, uh, actually my garden, uh, so I want to show you. They're not the easiest things to try to uh, video on your own. Um, I'm going to have to have somebody help me, because by the time you turn the soil over and they've done you're shooting them, then they, they kind of stop the wiggling. But this was the, oops, sorry, that's not the way that works. Let's go back. How I click onto these things makes a difference. Uh, I thought I clicked here. There we go. So there I am shoveling. Uh, there you see one of the ones. But here, that is very tall. And there upper surface. You can see there's a number of them there. That That's the soil directly underneath that wood mulch. So it's very close. And then you can see that behavior um, uh, once you've uncovered them. Uh, my partner is not a gardener, and he doesn't care for spiders, and these things just freak him out. <laughs> uh, and they do. They, it's pretty evident you have them. My home garden, so I wasn't overly concerned, although I thought, gosh, I hope I'm not moving uh, jumping worms. Well, I went four seasons here without seeing any at all. Two seasons ago is when I first saw them. I don't think I brought them with me in that way, um, but they probably very easily came in some plant uh, that I probably bought in Wisconsin after that. And again, that's how easily uh, they move. Brad species will move about 30 feet per year. Acres in a year. That's exactly how large Ryman Gardens is. So if you think about the fact that if you dropped a couple of worms in one spot, uh, in one year, uh, they could be entirely throughout the gardens. Um, and uh, once again, these things are voracious um, because they're on the top of the soil. They're eating all of that leaf litter, all of the organic matter on the top of the soil. Uh, and they can eliminate within a matter of a few years, 95% of that. Why is that a concern? Why has it been a concern in the Northeast? Many of our spring woodland uh, wildflowers have adapted and evolved um, to depend on what well, that's called the duff on the forest floor. So you eliminate all of that, you're eliminating all your wildflowers. And you already saw in the video that I showed you how they would affect old growth forests um, as well. So 
uh, if they're doing this that much faster than our, our standard earthworms, uh, this is an issue uh, to really be concerned about. And um, I want to I want to uh, jump in real quick on that map. Sure. Um, Donald Lewis has shared with us that the extension map shows reported distribution. Um, so just citizen reports. So there hasn't been a systematic survey of the state yet. So just to clarify that piece. Great, wonderful. Um, and that's why, I, like I said, I, I bet they're in a lot more play. Part of the problem is, and one of the reasons I want to do talks on this is, um, I'm not sure people yet recognize, they might say, well, that's a, that's a really wiggly worm, but not knowing that there is such a thing as an, an Asian jumping worm, they may not be aware that they already have them um, in their gardens. Um, so thanks so much for that, Don. Um, and again, uh, um, you, and I'm going to show you another picture of it. These castings that they create are very loose. Now, at one point, I was using earthworm castings uh, to improve soils, and they are great for soil improvement. They add to texture when you're mo um, mixing them in with existing soil. But when it becomes two, three, four inches of the very top of your soil, these little, uh, the castings are sort of round, they're slippery, and they move. When I first started seeing them in my garden, I thought, oh, this is nice. It looks like good friable soil. That's not the case. And so when it's very loose like that, it erodes very easily. It's so loose that uh, new plants can't develop their roots. Um, I noticed in the last two years, I was uh, moving to using a lot of plugs in my home garden because they establish better and smaller potted plants. And I was losing a lot of them and I'd come along and I'd find they were literally almost laying up and out of the ground uh, because there is no real substance in this frass uh, for them to start to establish. The other problem with it is, is the castings are hydrophobic. Um, there's hydrophilic, which means it attracts water. Hydrophobic means it repels water. So you have this layer of castings that are hydrophobic, they repel water, and I realized what they were doing for those small plants, especially the plugs that were trying to establish, is they were pushing the water right away from those uh, roots that needed to be developed. Um, and I've had to change uh, the context of what size plants I put into my garden to establish them, because I can't be running out there all the time and resetting uh, plants that are that small. Um, so the, again, different than what we, um, uh, the castings that these deeper earthworms are putting in the soil are helpful, uh, these are not. Uh, they're also denser than the native soil, so that causes compaction uh, in those woodland settings. And I've already mentioned that the uh, uh, wildflowers are very dependent on that. It's been, that's why it's been a huge uh, issue in the Northeast. So again, this is just more of why they're more detrimental. We've already talked about where they're from. Uh, again, the fact that they're in that very upper layer of the soil uh, is an issue in itself. Um, they're also parthenogenic. That means they can self-fertilize. That means they can reproduce even faster. Do they think of Trader Joe's? The girls just wrote it. <laughs> Um, they also, the, the fact that they are, uh, have an annual life cycle, uh, they also reproduce much faster. Um, so the, uh, you can actually have two to three adult cycles in one se single season. Very typical of anything that might be more annual than perennial. Um, and then we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about these cocoons. Um, in fact, when they first start talking about cocoons, I'm like, we're not talking butterflies here, um, but that's exactly what they have, and they overwinter uh, very well in the soils. And so the diagrams there are showing you that there are three different types of earthworms and the depth of soils that you will find them in, um, and the fact that these are up on the surface uh, is, is a real um, issue. And this is, again, you've already seen this, but this time I want to point out and I want to show you, see all of those little gray sort of round particles? That's all castings. 
Um, that's at the edge of um, one of my uh, beds along the sidewalk. Um, I have to go down through in the summer now, um, maybe once a week with a shovel and literally sh uh, take that shovel down the sidewalk uh, because my beds tend to be higher and these uh, castings all sort of flow down into the sidewalk. Um, so that creates a lot of issues in itself. Um, and again, they're, they're sort of hard. Uh, and when you figure there's much of it on the surface and it's repelling water, uh, you can see why that's a real issue um, in, a, in a garden and in garden beds. Um, here's what I was talking about before. Um, most of your European earthworms, it takes them 120 days to reach maturity. Well, that's a, pretty much the full season. But the um, Japanese uh, or Asian jumping worms, 60 days, that's short. Um, and so they can have two to three hatching. I find here in the Midwest, uh, where we're colder, uh, we probably have two where folks like where Carol lived, they, they could see three hatchings in a year. Their appetites, we've already mentioned, are absolutely voracious. The amount that they can consume in a single season. Um, if you are a gardener where you just have a, just sort of a layer of compost over top of soil, they can consume every bit of that compost uh, in a single season. Highly adaptive to temperature changes. Um, they have shown if you compost, and somebody asked about a compost uh, pile that they have, um, they have shown if you get the temperatures high enough um, that that could uh, uh, destroy the egg casings, but they'll survive very, very cold temperatures. Um, and, and again, they're so um, um, adaptive. Uh, they can be in poor soils, good soils. I think the fact uh, that uh, Allen Centennial Gardens saw that they could even uh, survive in uh, an alpine garden with basically no soil. Uh, most earthworms could never tolerate those uh, conditions. So in that case, then they're also out competing the earthworms uh, we currently don't feel are uh, an issue, um, as well as other uh, biologicals that we have in our soils. Um, they can be displacing them. Um, here are the cocoons little tiny, tiny round things, you're gonna have a really hard time trying to find them and identify them uh, in your garden because they look very similar to the frass. Um, so these little sort of black uh, little cocoons, uh, not very large at all, are all mixed in uh, with that frass. Um, so it's, it would not be um, at all that easy to identify or you know, any attempt uh, to try to remove them. Um, so what I have found on timing, and again, this has been two seasons now, and I adjusted some of the things I was doing this last season, because the first season that I had them, I wasn't paying exact attention to when I first started seeing them. Uh, but this also correlates with friends of mine in Madison. So here in this area, what I have found is I first start seeing that first round of adults right around mid-June or so. Well, that means that the eggs were um, laid in late April and into that May time period. Uh, so you'll see a real flush of them and they'll be really bad for probably about three weeks or so. Uh, then all of a sudden you just won't see very many at all. Um, and then there, uh, uh, late July and into August, all of a sudden there's a whole nother flush of them. So you know that's a whole second round of adults. That first round has laid their set of cocoons that are still there. And now here's a second set and they lay their cocoons um, before winter. Uh, so that's one of the problems. Even if we had methods of completely eliminating the adults, there are always at any given time cocoons in the soil. And that's uh, what makes them so difficult. How are they spread? You guys are mostly gardeners, I, I assume. You have a pretty good idea, I'm sure, how they spread. Um, obviously, any potted and B&B and &B plants um, that have any cocoons or even a single worm, uh, we already know that they can um, procreate with parthenogenesis, so you don't need to even have two of them. 
Um, so obviously they'll be moved down around that way. And obviously they're in mulches, soils, leaves, things of that nature. I've already told you, you know, there's a lot of communities now that are, are not allowing people uh, to spread mulch from place to place. Uh, the other problem is, is guess what a fisherman loves? They sure love a worm that when you put it on the hook, it wiggles around a lot because that's what attracts the fish. So these have been used very heavily by fishermen. And you know, when you go fishing and you have your container of worms that are sitting there, sometimes they get out, you might dump it over. Uh, when you leave the fishing site, you, don't want, you might not want to keep them, so you'll dump them out there. So they're getting spread that way as well, uh, a, a way that you might not even think about. Obviously, if you walk through a garden um, and uh, walk through areas where they, they exist, um, you can pick up the cocoons on shoes and boots. Uh, the other thing that um, I didn't even see listed, but I noticed here in my own home garden, is water. And water systems are obviously going to transport them. I happened to notice after one heavy rain, they were on the street um, um, from ha having been in my garden and getting washed down into the storm system. And I thought, oh my goodness, I never even thought about that. We're probably moving them around with rains um, that are moving them from spot to spot. And if they end up in streams and such, uh, that will continue uh, to make them move very rapidly as well. So here's the bad news, folks. Um, how do we control them? It, there are no easy solutions at this point. Uh, they are relatively new enough to us here in the Midwest um, that we're experimenting with different things. But even in the Northeast, there's a professor in Vermont that some of us have been uh, um, sort of communicating with, even on the East Coast where they've been for a long time, uh, they have not developed any effective control. Um, one of the things that we thought was going to be real helpful was the early bird uh, fertilizer. Uh, this is a fertilizer that's actually made from tea. Um, um, and it was being used as a vermicide by golf courses because they discovered that if you put it down on the golf course uh, and then it works its way down in, it's an irritant to the worms. It makes them come up to the top of the soil and then they would dry out and die or you could collect them. Um, unfortunately, at the NAC two years ago when I first realized I had the problem, um, there wasn't a place in Iowa that sells this product. Um, in fact, I found there was only one distributor for the Midwest. Uh, the product itself was coming out of Maine and that was in Juneau, Wisconsin, which is somewhat north um, of Milwaukee. I drove all the way to Juneau to buy 50 pound bags. I bought 12 bags at the time and little did I know that that would be 12 of the last bags that they would produce. Uh, they decided that um, they did not want to label this as a vermicide. Um, and I think also the availability of the tea with Chinese tariffs was affecting it too. They are no longer making the product. So, um, but I have used it over the past two years and I will say yes indeed when I put it down. You have to water this stuff in really, really good. It has to get down to where the worms are. Um, I should, probably should have shown you a picture of this. Um, I try to be careful when I do it because the worms do come out. They'll be all on the sidewalk. If it's near the sidewalks, they'll lay there and die and they will stink up the neighborhood. But again, all it's doing is knocking down my adult population. It doesn't get all of the adults and it doesn't do anything at all um, for the cocoons. Um, there's uh, ground mustard. It's an irritant as well. You can mix that with water uh, and put on, again, for large areas, that's not very practical. And the idea, once again, is, is it brings them up to the surface so they either dry up or, or you pick them up. Uh, a lot of my friends in Madison I'll go out and pick them up after a rain. That's a lot of work. Uh, they seal them in plastic bags so that they die in a plastic bag, much like the same way you would kill and dispose of garlic mustard. Uh, there's some evidence that biochar works. Biochar is uh, starting to get to be more popular and hopefully more available to home gardens. Um, this is a component a lot of people use to improve quality of soil 
where it works here, as you can see, it's very jagged. Um, so obviously it will do damage to the, the worms trying to crawl through it. Um, I've got several friends who are trying it right now. They said the big issue here is really getting it evenly distributed to your soil um, uh, is challenging. I threw in there because one of the sites said chickens and moles, but I don't think that's hardly a solution for us. It's just one of those things. Um, so really right now, there is no true effective control. And that's what makes it alarming. Um, and again, one of the reasons I'm getting the news out um, isn't because we can tell you this is what you can do to solve your problem, like many of the invasives we're already dealing with, it's to make you aware uh, of what you have. Um, there's more research being done. I mentioned the alfalfa pellets, the uh, professor in Vermont, said that a woman had contacted them. She said she had put down alfalfa uh, pellets, which a lot of people use as a nitrogen source. They had molded and uh, uh, produced dead uh, jumping worms. Well, they did trials and they had three different plots and they found one plot uh, seemed to kill the worms, one plot did nothing, and the other one, the, the worms actually seemed to multiply. So I think the thought is it's probably when the alfalfa pellets mold, it's whatever mold that it produces. Um, and they probably are gonna have to look into, um, it's not necessarily the alfalfa pellets, but what are the, the, the organisms uh, produced the one time uh, that might not have been produced the other two. I'm not sure about uh, that. Uh, but again, uh, more research has to be done on this. Uh, let's move ahead here. All right. Now, here's something that's a little interesting, and I don't expect you to look at that uh, triangle. It's very much like uh, and similar in some ways uh, to the soil triangle. This is recently something that I learned about, and for myself as a gardener, um, I think I'll, I'll, uh, I want to bring it up to you folks as well, because it was kind of a revelation to me. So the best advice we can give you as gardeners is keep adding compost. Um, they haven't been here long term enough to know, um, uh, you know, uh, how, you know, continually adding that, is that then going to be enough for your plants? Um, but really, that's the only thing that we can tell you. The other thing though is, and I'm a horticulturist that's taught a lot of classes. And in order to grow plants, I've grown mostly ornamental plants. And nine times out of 10, we're gonna tell you the reason you're struggling with garden plants is you don't have enough organic matter or compost in your soils. They're clay soils, they're difficult soils, they're dry soils. And, and we keep telling you, add compost, add compost, add compost. Well, here we've been telling you to do that. My own garden here, I've added a fairly amount of compost every year I've been here. Um, so I've actually have been creating a perfect environment for these organisms. This is um, um, something called a CSR ecological strategy. And what that triangle is showing you is not all plants adapt and utilize resources equally. And I think we all know that. And they've broken them down into three different groups. Uh, the rural plants are the ones, and you know some of those, it's like velvet leaf, uh, a plant that you disturb some soil and they're the first plants to come in uh, and establish. So they've evolved to um, take really sometimes some of the worst soils uh, you can imagine and they thrive in them. Your stress tolerators, um, one of the probably the best ways to describe these is these are probably many of the plants that are you that you are doing now under the native plant category. Uh, these are plants um, that have evolved in nature without all of this added compost, with what, whatever it is uh, that site provides for them. And they, th they thrive in those environments. The competitor, that's those really good, rich environments like I've just created for all of my ornamental plants. Now, guess what? It works great for a lot of those ornamentals that weren't native in the first place. But I've also noticed over time by doing that, 
when I do start to try to put in some of the natives, some of these other types of plants that have adapted differently, my, my um, ornamentals outcompete them. And, you know, I didn't think anything about it. It's like all plants, the better, more organic matter, the better. And that is not true. Uh, if you put these different plants in an environment that is different than what they've adapted to, they'll get outcompeted. So this is great news for somebody like me who loves ornamental plants. But I, um, to me, it seems like uh, the folks that are going more the native route, uh, um, uh, maybe converting some of my garden areas over to plants that can uh, that are more adapted to those thinner soils, those soils that aren't as organically rich, they might at least be, be uh, better equipped to compete with the worms and survive with the worms. This is pure speculation on my part at this at uh, this point. Um, but I have taken a couple beds and I've been experimenting with trying to drop down that sort of fertility level, uh, the amount of compost that's in them and put some more of these plants that fall under the stress tolerator in uh, to see if they maybe won't perform better um, in that kind of environment. But again, there's a lot of research um, that still needs to be done on these things. Um, they're going to spread. There's nothing we can really, uh, what we're not going to stop that no matter what we do. Saying that, I'm not saying then don't, don't, you know, don't not care. Um, I am no longer giving away plants out of my garden. I used to love to do that. Now I don't feel that I can uh, do that unless it's somebody that can tell me, well, I've already got the worms, so it's not going to hurt. I certainly want to mediate in any way um, my spreading uh, of them. So I think we should all try to mediate any kind of spread. Uh, but in the same regard, I don't think any of us um, can ever say that we'll have a point in time um, when we won't have them. Uh, we keep in touch in this hardy plant society that I belong to in Madison. And there was enormous amounts of panic when it first started coming into the area. Um, and actually there's a major, I won't say their name, there's a major um, uh, growing meaty soil uh, company in Wisconsin where it's even in their, their growing media now. Uh, so it's very, very difficult to keep them out. Um, uh, but they were very depressed and everybody's like, oh, I'm gonna have to give up gardening. I don't wanna have to deal with this. Um, but since 2013, most of those gardeners are saying, you know, we are, we're continuing to add organic mar uh, matter. We're gardening, they're there. Uh, but at the same time, they haven't devastated the garden to that point where there's no organic, organic matter um, and, and I don't have a garden anymore. Um, but it will, it's gonna require you probably to continue to add uh, where in the past, you know, you probably uh, could have done it with less frequency. Um, there are more and more resources coming out now. You'll notice I, that's um, the web page um, for um, uh, extension right here at Iowa State. So you can look that up. That's where I did get that uh, map off. Uh, Cornell down in the corner has uh, been, of course, doing quite a lot of work with it. And a lot right now coming out of that Madison area. Um, th that the, um, that's a flyer. Um, that was created there um, by their extension. Um, but like I said, it's, it's in areas like the, the, their, their um, Arboretum uh, and areas of Madison. So uh, been very concerned about the spread of it. Uh, they've uh, uh, done a lot of measures uh, as far as not moving around compost and things of that nature as well. That I believe is my final slide, it is. Um, am I back? Good. You are uh, back and I'm going to pin you so that people can see you. Um, I'm going to jump in with a few things from the chat. Um, the last thing here that Donald Lewis added was that the apparent active ingredient um, from I think the early bird was tea seed oil or tea seed meal from Camellia oleifera mm -hmm. under research since 2007. It quote expels all worthworms, not just jumping worms. So um, keep that in mind. And then there's temporary control for about five weeks. I know that um, 
there have been several comments in the chat about, you know, being a little bit frustrated with the only the only uh, real current um, treatment is to add compost, which further spreads the eggs and then therefore the worms. And so there's some questions about can we can we get the active ingredient for early bird? Can we share it? Is there a way to, you know, have a bunch of people purchase it together? Um, and I think you kind of helped talk a little bit about that, but um, uh, it was helpful to see some of those CSR resources. Um, and then when we do, when we when we send out the link um, or publicize the link on our YouTube channel, we'll also include some of those other resources, the extension resources, the Cornell, Wisconsin DNR and so forth. Yeah, um, and, and that's exactly what the folks in Madison were doing. Oh, yeah. Um, they got one retail store there to purchase the early bird from the company in Juneau because they were the only ones that were allowed to be the, the wholesaler to sell. Um, and then, of course, um, when um, Ocean decided to quit producing uh, early bird, the source is, is completely gone. Um, so only the people that had um, purchased it this way and might still have some. As far as the component itself, the active ingredient, I don't know, Don might, but I don't know of anything else out there that has that active ingredient in it uh, that you could you know, just substitute um, and not be necessarily an early bird. And that is indeed something I did forget to point out as I said, this was originally used on golf courses and it wasn't about jumping worms. They just didn't want earthworms. So indeed, uh, Don's right. Um, you're not gonna just be bringing up the jumping worms when you're doing this. You will probably also be getting, and, and I've noticed that using it myself, you'll get other earthworms as well. Um, so every time we disrupt that ecological balance in the soil, you know, we tried uh, desperately to get rid of one thing. Uh, we could be very well then impacting other uh, other microorganisms and um, earthworms and such. That's one of the concerns about mustard as well, is they're not entirely sure if you're using the mustard and it's an irritant and bringing up the worms, but is the mustard then also, it could it be also affecting other biologicals in the soil. So that, so that sort of brings us a, a follow-up question also from the chat that um, are you aware of any research that shows that kind of relationship that once there's a jumping worm population, it is inhibiting populations of other worm species or something like that? Yeah, the only thing that I've read and, you know, you saw in that video is if, if they're going through and voraciously eating, they're, they're not... They're, they're eating microorganisms right along with the soil. They're, they're not spitting anything out, so to speak. So yes, they're uh, in that upper surface, they're eliminating a lot of the other biologicals in the soil. And again, they are probably out competing and displacing um, uh, the other earthworms as well as probably other organisms. Anytime a population of anything gets too high, uh, they could be displacing populations. Um, I'm not sure how much thorough research there is on to what degree and what things have been displaced at this point, but we know it's at least doing that much. Great. Well, um, I'm going to go ahead and open this up. If anyone wants to add, we have about two more minutes. If anyone has other questions they want to just jump in, or if we have um, I know that Donald has some really great information. If there's anything else you want to share, feel free to unmute yourself and, and share that. Um, otherwise, um, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let you know that I was kicked off of the internet about halfway through this presentation. Uh, so when the recording does go up on YouTube, there will be a little bit of an interruption um, for that. So hopefully it won't be too bad. I'm waiting for the, the first recording to, to export. So <laughs> hopefully we'll get these videos jumped together um, was there anybody who wanted to jump in with another question? I will also point out too, when we found out we had them in our conservatory, we reached out to Oldbrook Botanical Gardens in Madison. Uh, we know they were in the gardens there and asked, are they in your conservatory? And he said, yes, we're pretty sure they are, but they have birds in their conservatory. They have quail and some other birds. 
Um, and he says, we think they're um, affecting some of the population. So of course I went right to J uh, Jesse and said, can we get quail for the conservatory? And she won't let me do that, so. <laughs> We'll go ahead and end our, our, our statement there. Um, Donald does say he was corrected a few years ago. There are still native earthworms um, in Southeast Iowa. So it's, it's, it's gonna be a struggle. It seems like a very gloomy outlook, but it looks like there's a lot of research that at least ha it has the possibility of showing us some new ways of, of working with these. Um, and maybe we'll bring you back as some of that research develops and you can tell us more about how that's going. And we're going to continue to see this. I'm rather anxious right now as somebody who loves lilies. The lily beetle is in Wisconsin. You know, it, it's funny. People think there's some kind of border um, the lily beetle will get here. We have the spotted lantern fly out on the East Coast, which Carol's probably dealing with that right now. That'll head her. I mean, this is going to be our, our way of life, our way of gardening down the line. We're going to continue to see these issues, you know, and some of them over time will develop their own predators as they move. Japanese beetles over time eventually get new predators and population levels drop. Hopefully that could happen also with, with the worms. Um, the bad thing is, is that populations will drop, they'll become more manageable for a lot of these invasives, but they, they simply won't go away. It's something we're going to have to learn to live with. Well, thank you very much. This has been quite informative. Um, and uh, just keep composting, everybody. <laughs> All right, well, thanks, and again, getting your compost from good sources that are heating. Um, this is, again, where you want to be careful, uh, you know, just taking free compost from, from sites. Um, it's probably going to be worthwhile to pay for compost that's been uh, properly cured. So thank you, everybody. I appreciate you, you joining.